Functions are ubiquitous in programming. A function is essentially a reusable piece of code. Typically, this block of code will receive some inputs, perform a calculation, and then return an output. We have already been using many functions which come built in with Python. Altogether, there are approximately 70 such built in functions, as shown in this list. We are already familiar with print, input, boolean function, the val function, the int, float, and complex functions, together with our type and lent functions. These built-in functions are automatically available whenever you call the Python interpreter. There are many, many more functions available that which you can load from what we call modules. And indeed, you are completely free to create your own functions and modules in Python. First, let's look at how we can create our own new functions. The motivation behind functions is when you are planning your program and you see that there will be a, a block of code that will perform a specific task and you plan on performing this task multiple times in the program. The ideal here is that instead of having this block of code repeated multiple times, you convert it into a function and you call the function multiple times instead. To start, let's look at a very simple example. New functions are created in your code using the def command. Here we will make a very simple function to say our traditional phrase, hello world, and print that to the screen. The makeup of a function block starts with the def command for define. Next, you have a name of your function. Again, you can use any name you like. Following the name, there's normal curvy brackets. And typically, in those brackets, you'll have any input variables that you would like to use in your function. To end the definition line, use a colon symbol, and then press and return automatically indents the code block of the function. Everything indented in that block are the commands of the function. The final part of the function is a return statement, and the return statement returns your output values, if you have any. This function does absolutely nothing until you call it. So the contents of the function don't actually get carried out unless you, you invoke or call the function. And indeed, you could have dozens of such functions populating your program, and they will do nothing unless they are called within the main program. To call a function, you just simply use its name followed by a curvy bracket. And the use of a curvy bracket always implies that it's a function call. Our function call for hello takes no inputs and simply prints hello world to screen. Unlike this simple example, most functions you will write will contain inputs and create outputs. Let's have a look at how we can do this in Python. In programming speak, inputs are passed to a function. Typically, these are assigned to new variables within that function. These variables are local within that function. After some calculation, the output or outputs are returned using the return command. Let's look at another simple example. In this case, we're going to define a function to convert from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Notice in this function, we have one input now defined called temp. Temp will exist only when inside this function. The calculation within the function will be assigned to a new variable called k, which will be returned. When we call the function below, we'll pass the number 100. And this number 100 will get mapped on or assigned to the variable temp. After completing the calculation, the value of k is then returned and assigned to the variable t. Hence, when defining your own functions using inputs and outputs, you will have to become comfortable with how values get assigned between input variables and output variables. The essence of this is the fact that the variables used in the code block of the function don't exist beyond it. There are variables that are local to that function. While any constants can be defined in the function block itself, variables should all be passed to the function using the curvy or round brackets. So whenever you do define a function, check to make sure that it has sufficient numbers of inputs 
to cover all of the variables needed. Next, let's look at a simple example using a single input. This function may be already familiar to you from an earlier video. It's a function we use a lot in physics, particularly relativity, where we want to calculate the relativistic gamma factor, or Lorentz factor, as it's also known as. It's a nice excuse to show you how, on a Jupyter notebook, you can create very nicely formatted equations in Markdown. And here in Markdown, we use a double dollar symbol before and after a numbered equation or an equation that has its own line. And we can use single dollar symbols to define inline equations. The symbols here are defined using backslash gamma, backslash beta, etc. These are the standard LaTeX style symbols that you can learn more about if you write your technical reports in LaTeX. So as a guide, we have our equation written now on the top of this Jupyter notebook. And next we'll make a cell for the code. The code will start again with the def command. We give it a function name. The single input inside the round brackets is the velocity v. We can also, of course, just pass the constant c for the speed of light. However, since this will never change, it makes more sense to include it in the function itself as a constant. We can calculate the beta variable and then the gamma factor using our equation above. Notice how we can calculate a square root by simply raising the power to a factor of a half. Our next step in the function is to return the value. Now we can return the variable gamma, or it may be more efficient to remove the gamma variable entirely and just return the expression for the value itself. Once we run this piece of code, we can check whether it's done anything. All it's done is add the function gamma to memory. No variables or nothing has been calculated. If we call the function now, using some input such as 2 to the power of 8, we get an answer for the gamma factor of 1.34. We can also assign a variable g to this value so that the output is passed to a new variable and print that. And again, that's the same. And again, we can check using the whose command what variables we have. And it's clear that the variable v and beta do not exist beyond the function itself. These are local variables. The final step in defining our function is also to add a doc string. And the doc string, as we mentioned in the good practice video, consists of a triple quotation mark between which you should see text appears red, indicating that it's a comment. And this comment we want to add to describe what the function does, what inputs it requires, and what outputs it produces. Together with the doc string, we should always use comments at the end of some lines to indicate units, for example. And we do this using the hash symbol. If your program uses multiple functions, you are free to call a function within a function. And you should also be aware that you can call the function itself within itself. For example, if we go back to our original example of hello, we can show very easily that calling the function within itself leads to a recursive behavior. You should be very careful if you see this in your code as it can create an infinite process. Here you should have some kind of conditional component to stop it happening after one or two or so many steps. These conditional statements we'll look at further in a future lecture. Another feature of functions is the ability to pass optional arguments or optional inputs. For example, if in our original hello function we had an input for names, we could ask our function to print hello Jim or hello Bob. We can also use this optional arguments, which is defined using a star symbol. Star others implies that the variable others could be multiple other names or multiple other inputs such as Sue and Rita. So depending on how many people we wanted to say hello to, this optional argument would cover all of those eventualities. Optional arguments aren't typically needed when you're defining most functions, but in cases where you do need it, it's good to be aware of how to do it. Collections of functions can be stored in what we call modules. Now, a module is a simple file that stores multiple functions. And in Python, you've typically used built-in modules already. 
These are written by the Python community and you can of course also write your own. Modules essentially allow you to reuse functions, variables and classes in other programs. If you think that other people may benefit from the functions you write, you can of course publish or contribute them to the Python community. Let's look at a selection of the top modules we use for science. First on our list is numerical Python. Next there is matplotlib and scientific Python. NumPy or numerical Python provides a whole host of numerical tools enabling us to use data arrays, maths, algebra, Fourier transforms, random numbers, and much, much more. For visualizing data, matplotlib.plyplot will provide you everything you need to visualize your data in two or three dimensions and also to save high quality images of your graphs. Scientific Python is a module that actually includes the NumPy module together with additional functions to handle statistics such as curve fitting and also integration, interpolation and even signal analysis. A further set of useful modules for science in Python include Symbolic Python or SymPy, which is a fully featured computer algebra system similar to Mathematica. AstroPy, which is used for studying astronomy and astrophysics. Cyton, which enables you to use C data types and functions, and you can then compile and improve the runtime of your Python code. In cases where you're performing repetitive numerical calculations, such implementation using Cyton can reduce the runtime by three or four orders of magnitude. The multiprocessing module also enables much more rapid calculations in cases where you can divide the numerical work between all the processing cores of your computer. These modules are not loaded by default in Python. Indeed, to save resources, it is more efficient to import what modules or functions you require. To do so, we can use the import command. The import command requires the name of the module. The contents of the module are then loaded into memory. For example, import numpy or numerical Python then enables us to use the numpy functions by calling numpy dot function name. It may be slightly more efficient to shorten the name of the module, such as import numpy as np. This is an alias, so this shortened prefix reduces how much typing we need to do whenever we call a numpy function. But again, for the prefix or alias, you can use whatever you like. You can also just import specific functions such as mean or array from our numpy module. And again, this conserves resources such as memory. If you see instructions to import modules using import star, this is best avoided. Import star imports all the functions without a module prefix. So all of the function names are loaded into your namespace, potentially overwriting similar named functions from your program. And your namespace will then contain hundreds, if not thousands of items, making it very difficult to view variables and resources. Typically, in everyday programming, you'll just simply import a module and using an alias to shorten the prefix. Next, let's look at some relevant examples using the IPython interpreter. Once we start the interpreter, we can now experiment with different ways we can import modules. First, let's check the namespace. So, so far nothing is in memory. Once we import our first module, NumPy, we can see now it's loaded into memory and we can start exploring what functions it has. Firstly, we'll call a sign function of 0.5 radians and we get the answer. Next, we can check what functions start with S and when you type S, type tab. And after you type tab, it will print onto the screen the options that you can call with functions starting with those letters. So we also see that for functions starting with CO, we've got a selection, LI. So the interpreter again enables you to experiment quite quickly with what modules they contain. We can clear the interpreter screen by typing clear. If we check our namespace again, we see NumPy is still in memory. We can remove it from memory by using the del or delete command. So we del Python removes it from memory. And now there's nothing there. We can import NumPy once again as a shortened prefix np.
Next, let's import the visualization module, matplotlib. And here we'll import it as a prefix plt. Now our namespace contains both numpy and matplotlib. As an example of some visualization, let's calculate the motion of an object thrown into the air. So we expect some kind of parabolic motion. The height or position of this object we're going to visualize as a function of time. And linspace will enable us to define a linear array of values for time t. Starting at, for example, 0, ending at a value of 10, and having 100 data points in between. And always make sure that you've got the prefix of the module before the function call. Now that we have t defined, we will print t to screen. We can see there's 100 values there. Next, we will define a value for an initial velocity of 50 meters per second, some acceleration, and our y position. Now we can use our kinematic equation, position is equal to initial speed by time minus a half acceleration by time squared. So this is just a simple example. So we can now visualize and use matplotlib to see the function y of t on a graph. To do so, we will take our matplotlib command plot. And this is a very useful command. We take some data for the x-axis, which is t in this case, and y for the y-axis. And we are going to visualize or plot the data using a sequence of points. We can also add labels for the x and y axis. And again, these labels are simple strings with some units such as seconds for time. And for height, it will be meters. We can then show the overall graph by using the plt.show command. And we have a simple 2D graph, nicely labeled on x and y axis, showing the characteristic parabolic motion. Next, let's look at how we can create our own new modules. If we import a Python file into our program, any functions contained within that file will be treated as methods. This file is then referred to as a module. So when importing a module, just make sure that the file is in your current directory or it's in a folder that's known to the Python interpreter. Let's look at an example where we can use our relativistic function gamma to start a module. First, let's go and retrieve the existing code that we've written previously for gamma. We'll copy and paste this into a Python text file. So let's create a text file called relativistic.py, and this will be the name of our module. We can now paste our gamma or Lorentz function there. And in most modules, you can expect multiple functions will be contained. So in this case, we will add a function also to calculate the relativistic mass increase. And since the constant c will be used amongst all our functions in this module, we can set it up to be a global variable called c. So c now will exist in and outside our functions, so we don't need to redefine it each time. Our mass increase function is very similar. We simply return a value gamma times mass. And we'll just rename our Lorenz name to Gamma. So that's it. We've got our module made. It's very, very simple. We'll update the doc string for the module. Save it. And now if we test out our module, we can simply use the Python interpreter. We can import our module because it's in the current directory. So we import relativistic. We'll give it a a shortened name such as 
re. So we've imported our module. Once we've got the module prefix or e, we can then just call one of the methods such as gamma or mass. And we can test out our module very, very quickly. So going to a higher velocity obviously gives us a larger gamma factor. And the mass increase will be simply, in this case, a factor of 40 times larger. So using the simple examples, I hope you can see that making your own modules, if it's necessary, and in most cases it's not, but if it is necessary to improve the, the efficiency of your, of your project, then it's quite a simple task to perform. Next, let's look at how we can list the contents of modules, particularly when you import a Python module from the standard library. It can typically contain many, many functions. So it's useful to be able to explore what these modules contain. First command is dir for directory. And again, if you put the name of the module inside the brackets, it will print out the list. Likewise for help, it will give you a more detailed list of the functions contained together with some basic documentation. In summary, functions are typically quite easy to define using our def command. The contents of the function is then indented to define what commands it should perform until it returns a output value. Collections of functions can be stored in a module file and you can load a module either from the existing library or from your own creation. The documentation functions such as dir and help can enable you to have an overview on what the module contains.